Hi guys, how is everybody? Happy Thursday, happy Thursday. Can everyone hear me nice and loud and clearly? Hello, 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 hello. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Cool, uh, we have a very, very, very awesome show lined up for you today. We have the awesome Garrett Wong with us, my dear, dear friend the Comic-Con King, Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager. We're not gonna let him wait anymore. We're gonna bring him right into the room. So let's get some frack years out there. Woo, frack yeah, frack yeah. We love Harry Kim, Garrett. Ah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> I, I, it's been, I don't even, what, when was the last time? What Comic Con was it? Because we almost would see each other. Dragon Con. Dragon Con, boo. Last year. Oh no, what, what was your- Do you remember? You came to my party. Oh, you throw the best parties. <laughs> we had to, we have to be like, as soon as Dragon Con starts, we're like, where's Garrett's party? This must happen. <laughs> what have you been doing? Oh my gosh, I've been, um, you know, dealing with the world changing <laughs> like everybody else. Uh, 
and trying to take it in stride and trying to see the glass as half full and be as optimistic as possible. Um, started doing a new project, a, a podcast of my own, where uh, Robbie McNeil, who played Tom Paris on Voyager, he and I um, co-host. Uh, we review all the episodes of Voyager. We're in season two now. We just started season two episodes right now. So we just launched this in May. So it's pretty brand new. And um, you can find a podcast on um, iTunes and Spotify and we also have an extended bonus version available on Patreon. So that's been my life. Good recently. on you. So, and that was May, yeah. May the 4th that came out, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We had to launch it on Star Wars Day. That was important. Yeah, we've all <laughs> had to sort of uh, just sort of find a way to keep in touch with each other and, and yeah. reinvent a way to, to share the love one way or another, huh? Definitely. So who else have you had on your little uh, show besides well, me? Well, I've had a lot of the Farscape gang. I've had yeah. some Power Rangers. I've yeah. had uh, the creator of Farscape as well, Rockney S.O. Bannon, and he does a yeah. pretty amazing show on CBS as well. Uh, right. Who else has been? Oh, lots of the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge guys. Okay. Uh, but you're my first uh, Trekkie, actually. I'm like, oh, wow. the Star Trek universe. Yay. And yeah. I do believe you're my first uh, coolest bachelor. And, the coolest well, oh you read that yeah yes each, yeah. etv each and <laughs> and wait a minute i didn't even know this how do I, how have i known you for so long and one of the most beautiful people in the world oh. see now that was in 1997 <laughs> when i was people magazine's 50 most beautiful people the funny thing is that the next year in 1998 when i wasn't in the issue the makeup artists on voyager were like well garrett i guess you're 87 now you didn't oh, make the 50 most beautiful so each year <laughs> after the the year that i made it in that magazine they kept adding numbers to it they said i guess you're a number 196 now you're just not as beautiful enough to be in the magazine again so. they know how to make but you that, feel good huh they do they do but that was a nice accomplishment that came out of nowhere that was literally do you know how i got that no i please there's only, there's only one other person in the star trek world that was in that issue of that people magazine 50 most beautiful people issue which a lot of people confuse as the 50 most sexiest people. There's no such thing. It's the most beautiful people issue. Um, I was doing a convention in Denver, Colorado, and I was on stage and I was just killing it on stage. Like everything, everything flowed correctly. Even things that were messed up, like mistakes, like my fly was unzipped and what? stuff. I didn't even know this until 20 minutes into it, right? So even that, when I was told about it, you know, most people would be like, oh my God, everyone's you know, basically been seeing my junk. And, and I literally, I used it and I zipped it back up and I used it as part of the show, but it was so fluid. Like you, I mean, you, you've, you've done mini cons yes. just like I have. And you know, there's, there's some stage panels that go better than others. Like this one was flawless. flawless. Somebody, somebody was sitting in the audience that had connections to People Magazine. And they, they told somebody at the People office, like this guy just, unbelievable um he was amazing on stage you should have him in the issue and they put me in the issue that was a big deal that's so. huge because yeah. you you've moderated me at a convention too you're how did you go in from from acting mode because also i i've been i've been researching you a lot and i've been enjoying it thoroughly because i know you yeah. well as a, a dear friend but I, i've really fallen into all the bits and pieces that is you. So thank you for, yeah. for letting me explore your universe. And yeah. I as I heard that you were the first Voyager actor uh, that did the Comic Cons. You did, what, 17 before the other guys jumped on board. Did you get them That's into right. them or? Did I get used to them? What did you say? Did you get the, your cast members into Comic Cons from Voyager or did they just kind of see how much you were enjoying it and started to join the party? Well, they all came to me with questions. So I'm like the youngest one in the cast, but they're, they're, I'm the Yoda of convention yeah. going. Like I'm the wise old guy. So they were all asking me, what's it like? What are the fans like, you know, in the beginning? And, and they all know now. They've done plenty of them themselves. So they're all good. But we, um, gosh, I've known you for so long. And I'm a little shocked that, I'm, I'm, that you didn't ask me as a guest in the very beginning <gasps> because you have so many G's in your name. I know. And my name begins with G as well. I so actually... I thought that's natural. Don't joke. I was actually in the shower of all places, washing my hair, and I was like, it's going to go well because we've both got G names. Like, this is how my head thinks. So, and I'm just so <laughs> random that you bring that up. We're, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> I was sensing yeah. you in the shower. That's so weird. Yeah, it is a little weird and a little creepy. But, that's uh, cool uh, too. That's so 
Oh, totally blushing now. Thanks for that. And yeah. I, so I'm just going to change the direction can of this I, conversation. Uh, hey. You can, but can I just, I just want to throw it out there. I didn't watch your show until much later oh. because when your show was on air, and you know how it is. When you're filming something and something else comes out, you don't have time to really watch it, yeah. right? So I, I didn't really watch it. And part of it was because I saw commercials for Farscape and they showed Rigel. And I thought, am mm. I gonna watch a Muppet? Like I literally let that turn me off to it, you know, because the Henson you know, company was behind it. And I kept, I said, I'm not gonna watch a Muppet sci-fi show. Cause I thought literally that, that it was all Muppet characters, you yeah. know, whatever. And then I had to moderate in Germany at FedCon Claudia Black and Ben Browder. I had to moderate their so panel. you had to go so watch said, it. So I said, I need to watch at least the pilot episode of Farscape, <laughs> just the pilot. I'm gonna watch that damn Muppet show. So I turn it on and I watch it and I go, oh my God. And I, I watch the next episode. I watch, I binge watch every episode in that that was ever produced of Farscape. I love the show. It's a pretty, Absolutely love it's it. pretty trippy show. Like one of the things that I thought about it is it's very wild, and it didn't feel like your stereotypical sci-fi. It just felt like a a, a mess of a, a crew trying to find their way, scramble their yeah. way through the uncharted territories. And it was it, an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, and you heard that there's there's been serious talk that they want to shoot in Australia. They were aiming for this year, but then the world turned upside down with original cast members, a new series. And I'm like, oh, hurry up. What? Yes. Like a sequel, like a spin-off show? Yes, like, a, yes. Like wow. a, a new series with a, a original cast members and obviously some fresh meat as well. Uh, yeah. And because we did, it was the 20th anniversary last year and um, I actually organised for... Brian Henson, Ben Browder, uh, Rockney, the creator, and some of the other cast members to do San Diego Comic Con, Dragon Con, and then Winter Con. And at each of the panels, Brian and Rockney both said, yes, we've written a new series and we intend to shoot it next year in Australia, this year, and then the world stopped. <laughs> oh and I God. was like, come on now. <laughs> well, I'm ex so excited to hear this news because I one of the, my biggest regrets is that I never got a chance to even possibly guest star on the original. Yes, I'll put in a good I'll put in a good word. If you could. And you know, one of the one of the most endearing things about Farscape is that it was filmed in Australia, mm -hmm. your home country. And because of that, all your guest stars, all your guest star aliens all had Aussie accents, which is great. You just see this alien come on like, good eye, mate. It's like, oh my God. He's speaking with an Aussie accent. It's so sweet and endearing. It's really and that's weird. That's how we isn't are as it? Americans. We love your accent. Do you? That's, that's I can't imagine. Point. It just sounds so weird to it, me. Americans in general, nine out of ten will say, "I love the English accent. I love the Australian accent. I love the New Zealand accent. Any UK accent, most Americans are just enamored with. I, I, I maybe because former colony. I don't know. Who knows? You know? Well, thank goodness right? for that. Otherwise, I'd be in big dren. <laughs> is it true that you almost ran over Harrison Ford? Yes. <laughs> Before I tell that story, I'm going to tell you, I, I've had more than one brush with danger with another celeb. Um, I was zooming out of my gym. I used to work out at a, at a gym in West LA and the parking was subterranean. So, and it was kind of a blind hill. So as you're exiting, you literally, if you're not watching and paying attention, you could run into the car coming into the garage, right? And it was a very narrow driveway. And that's exactly what happened. As I'm exiting a little bit too fast, another car was coming in a little too fast. We both slam on our brakes and I look up and I'm like, oh, oh my God, it's Ted Danson. So I almost had a, a head on collision with Ted Danson. Oh my okay. God. And then, uh, then the next time um, <laughs> it was literally uh, traveling too fast around the Paramount parking lot, trying to find parking because I was told that I booked the job and mm -hmm. I had to get down there to a wardrobe fitting before they closed the wardrobe department that day. And a guy walks out between two cars and right in front of my car and I slam on the brakes and, and literally inches of, of taking this person's legs out. And it was Harrison Ford oh. and he was wearing his suit that I saw in the Variety uh, paper, uh, trade paper the next day, Harrison Ford at Paramount Studios for the clear and present, clear and, uh, what, clear and present, present danger, clear, what am I trying to say? That <laughs> the, one. The, the, the Tom Clancy <laughs> novel film that he, that he was, uh, clear and present danger, I think. Oh. He was at the premiere for that. He's wearing the same suit that I almost knocked him out in. And um, 
you know, uh, yeah. What did you and do? I, you know, I, I'm going against stereotypes because typically Asians, I think, are the worst drivers on the planet in terms of they, they're so slow. I am not the slow Asian driver. I think I have a lead foot because I'm trying to prove to everybody that Asians can drive like Mario and Dreddy, right? We can be race car drivers. So, but it's gotten me almost in hot water. And Harrison Ford, Ted Danson, right? These close There's calls. a list. Remind me never to be near you in a car. I might be next. <laughs> You don't yeah. want to. You don't want to see um, me drive. You're yeah, terrified. Are you? Are you an aggressive driver? No, Gigi? I just. I don't think I'm aggressive. Well, I haven't had a car for two years. I only got a car the like a week ago. I'm like, ee! and my little girl, because she's 19 months old, Skywalker, because we were all I such geeks. I can't believe you have a. Oh, this is crazy. She calls it beep beep. So she's like a beep 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 beep. beep, beep, beep. I'm like okay. So I'm thinking maybe I could get the little license plate beep beep because she's yeah. So it's pretty cool. So now I, I have I can go places. But then I finally got a car. I'm like, wait, where am I going to go? Everything's still shut down. So I just sit in it. <laughs> Awkward. So how'd you get how'd you get around before her then? If you haven't um, had um a... lifts, Ubers, uh, <laughs> wrangling cars off partners, etc. I'm like, oh honey, can I please borrow the car again? So oh it's been two years and it's ever since wow. Bubba's been here. So, it, well, mostly we've been at Comic Cons every weekend. And then when yeah. I'm at home, I'm I'm unpacking and repacking for this. So I don't, you know, there's not too much of a need for it. Now I've finally got one. I've got no place to go because LA is still in hardcore shutdown, really. Yeah. So yeah. where where are you? Where are you based out of? I, I'm currently, well, I just had, uh, I had surgery in May, as you can see this big scar right here. What's that? Um, what, ha what happened? Why, why, why? Oh God. Well, I had a, um, I had a disc between my C4 and C5 vertebrae that was completely blown out. It was so swollen that it was pushing into my spinal fluid and into my spine. And these days to operate on your spine, they go in through the front of your neck, which is the thought of that is kind of gnarly. <laughs> They're going in through the front to get to the back, but they replaced my disc with an artificial disc. So I'm kind of um, bionic now. You are the, the bionic man. I'm the bionic boy. Yeah, the bionic, bionic man. boy. Yeah, yeah, that was um, that was tough. It was affecting my mobility. My hands were su super numb. My knees were, were kind of like giving out under, um, on weird times. Oh I'd just be walking and I would collapse. So it was not good. Um, so that was my last... How uh, you know, thing that I've been dealing with other than the podcast. I had my surgery at UCLA. So I've been jumping back and forth between LA with surgery, uh, physical therapy, recuperation, coming back up to Canada where my, my significant other lives in Calgary, which is where I'm at right now. Um, we're in Calgary. Um, but but from my background, it looks like I'm out in, are you in space. In outer space? <laughs> are you in the you uncharted? Like are you in the uncharted territories? I like that I'm my dress matches it. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> So bef before you fell into the Star Trek universe, did you watch it like a, 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 as a kid? Did you like it? Did you were you into it, or was it just another show? I loved all science fiction. Really, you've been a, a huge geek? fan of all sci-fi. My my first sci-fi I ever watched was 1977 Star Wars oh. in the in the movie theater. Mm. Um, I was born in '68, so uh, I was you know eight or nine years old at the time when I saw that movie, which then made me fall in love with sci-fi. From that point forward, I watched everything. Um, yeah, the original series was on in reruns at home. I wasn't really a big fan of the original series because if you're a nine-year-old watching original Star Wars, 1977 Star Wars, the visual effects, everything looks so much better than 1966 mm. television sci-fi. So, you know, that was that was because I was a kid. But I, I've really watched and followed every type of sci-fi program since then and just been a huge huge fan and you know the crazy thing and you'll agree with this um gg on this is when we're at conventions i think the majority of fans have the assumption that everybody that they know on a sci-fi like show whether it's star trek farscape they assume that all the actors are fans of that genre and that's just not true it's usually 10 percent is what i say like 90 percent are just actors acting in their job yeah. the, and there's 10 percent that are just sci-fi nerds such as myself so so you are a true sci-fi nerd alert, nerd alert. I am. Boop, I am. So I am. if you were to go back to your younger self and go, oh, one day you're going to be actually, you know, traveling on a spaceship and you're going to be uh, working with these amazing crew for years and years and years, 172 episodes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. 
How, what was the audition process like? Long and arduous. Really? It was, uh, yeah, it was interesting because um, at the time, and, and you might attest to this also, as actors, um, there are days that, or there are, are weeks and months, periods that we feel like we are on like we're on it, you know what I'm saying? Like our energy is good. Everything that we're doing um, pre and post audition is just, it's like clockwork, mm. you know, and, and it's coming off super well. Um, and I was going through that period at that time where it didn't matter what I was auditioning for. I was booking literally yes, everything that I was going out so for. Good. It was wonderful, yeah. And so when I walked into that first uh, audition for Voyager, um, I had just finished a callback audition for a movie called um, Glory Days. And that feature film had a pretty much unknown Ben Affleck in it as the lead. I was the second lead. Yeah. There's an unknown, um, a, a very, at least not well-known, um, Matthew McConaughey uh, was in there. So uh, this this movie had a lot of people who everyone, who people know now that back then they were just newbies, right? So Matthew McConaughey had a very small role in it. Um, French Stewart from Third Rock from the Sun was also in that movie. Sam Rockwell was in that movie. So the leads were Ben Affleck was the, was the number one lead. I was the second lead. The third lead was French Stewart. Then the fourth lead was a friend of the director, writer. And the fifth lead was Sam Rockwell. So this Jeez. was an amazing cast. And it was about four guys or five guys that lived together in a house in Santa Cruz, California that were going to college. and. They were roommates, and my character was the lead singer of a punk band, which, if you think about it, in the 90s, the mid-90s, to, to have a role as an Asian-American where you're not, you know, you're not Chinatown mafia guy, you're not delivering Chinese food, there's no chop sake accent, but I'm playing an Asian-American dude that's a lead singer in a punk band. Whoa. I mean, that was just huge. And so the callback audition that I was at, after I did the first reading, the director was like, okay, I'm giving you guys this cassette tape. Remember cassette tapes, everybody? Cassette tapes. And on this tape is a recording of a punk song. When you call them back for your call, your callback audition, you have no lines. All you have to do is either lip sync or sing this oh, punk geez. song oh. for your callback audition. Oh. So I started out lip syncing. I did not try to get all fancy, but I ended up singing the whole damn thing. And, and at the end, I was like, I was like literally I, I had whatever I was wearing I tore I, I the, the chair that was there for me to sit on I threw against the wall and I was just and at the end of the of the song you hear the lead singer screaming the name of the song is 21 it's about turning 21 and becoming an adult and being able to drink and being able to do do whatever you want so at the end of this song you see the you hear the lead singer screaming 20 and so what I did in the audition was I was just going to, I was going to go 21, but at the last second I went 21 and I flipped off the director and I flipped off the, off the producers and I was just, just, just giving them the just bird and everything. It. Oh, it was great. And so when I was done, like literally just all the faces of everybody in that audition were like, and the director, <laughs> he was, he was recording it on camera and he, he hit, he hit stop. He walks out from around the camera and he walks up to me and then the writer director, his name is Rich Wilkes and he's about six foot four. So about five inches taller than me. And he grabs me and he bear hugs me and lifts me off the ground. Like my feet are dangling. And he's like, I love you, man. And at that point I knew I booked this role. I know I booked this. So from that point, that callback, I rushed to Paramount Studios and walk into my first reading for Voyager. And it's a first reading, so I'm, I didn't memorize it. So as I'm reading with the casting director, Nan Dutton, she's flipping out. She stops me after the first sentence. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm auditioning. And she's like, well, why is the script in front of you? Oh, no. Why haven't you memorized? I said, well, because it's a first read. First read, I'm allowed to be on book, right? I mean, what the? And she's like, let me tell you a story. Do you know who Andy Garcia is? I said, yeah, the actor? Yeah. <laughs> I cast a film called Eight Million Ways to Die. Are you familiar with that movie? I go, yes, I am. I've seen it. I, I, I enjoyed the film. It's about, uh, he plays a, glum, a Colombian drug lord. He's like, that's right. And that was his very first big project that he came in. 
an audition for and he got so in his first audition do you think andy garcia was what? unprepared like you and i said <laughs> and i said um uh oh. no no and she's like that's right he was prepared he was off book he wasn't reading from his script and that's what makes him a star and you not oh my <laughs> lord yeah. so i was verbally abused by her oh, right? and i geez. sat there and i went but and so she looks at me and she says you know what get out of my office and i was like oh and I'm, I'm i'm speechless and she says go learn those damn lines and come back 20 minutes from now vicious, do this audition. Vicious. Yeah. yeah so i walk out and i talk to the casting associate she goes like what happened i said well your boss just ripped me a new one i mean she just literally she chastised me she verbally <laughs> abused me she yelled at me she told me i'm not a star you know she told me all these things and she's like, like mm -hmm. and I'm, frankly and then and then <laughs> my feelings were hurt and so then the casting associate libby she says so and then what well then she told me to leave the office and and go over the lines and come back and read them for her and then libby goes really i go yeah why oh she loves you then she loves me <laughs> oh she loved me no one is allowed to come back and read again if she doesn't like you you know Ooh. this is a big deal Ooh. and so then i'm so flabbergasted because literally oh, one part I didn't add in is when I told when she asked me why I don't why aren't you off book I said because I just came from a callback audition that I uh, that I booked and I found out from uh, I, w I was paged by on my little pager oh right before I walked in and I booked the role and um, and she was like oh really you booked a movie what's it called and so I told her and the director and I go who's directing that and I told her the name she was like never heard of it so she was again she was so mean to me and then she told me to leave. And so I was so flabbergasted. I looked at the casting associate. I said, listen, I'm really, really just out of sorts right now. I just, I put all this time into doing this callback audition for a movie. I come here to audition for Voyager for Star Trek and I got treated like crap. And I'm honestly, I'm just tired. And I just want to, can you just reschedule? And the casting assistant's like, what? What? I said, can you, I, I literally said, can you You've ask your boss balls? to reschedule? Oh my yeah, God. She, and she said, she was like, oh, she's like, She's like, you're not going to make me do this. You're really, because, you know, Nan was tough on her too. Right? Oh, so she says, oh. I can't do that. I go, Libby, please just, just try it. She goes, okay, Karen, if I'm going to do this for you, you need to leave the office, go into the alley <laughs> around the corner. There's a, there's a, there's a garbage can, like a dumpster and just hide behind the dumpster and read your lines. Because what? if I get a no, <laughs> if I get a no, I don't want her screaming at you and me. Cause you're in the, in the office waiting area. So I go, okay, I'll go hide behind the dumpster. So I did went behind the dumpster. 10 minutes later, Libby comes around the alley. And she's like, Garrett, Garrett, I'm, I'm right here. She goes, oh my God, guess what? I go, what? Nan agreed to let you reschedule. You can come in two days from now. I'm like, whoa, oh. that's awesome. Yeah. And she's like, she totally loves you. She really, cause she's number one. She's never rescheduled oh. another actor before this. I don't know what you've done with, did with her. And honestly, I didn't do anything. I just felt like I got abused the entire time. So that was my first what audition. What a trip. Then you never know, do you? You never know. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's such yeah. a weird industry. Like some things you yeah. can come out of you like, I totally nailed that. And they're like, yeah. oh my God, that was amazing. And are you available? And, da, da, da. and you're like, well, yeah. And, yeah. Then, and nothing. And then vice no, versa. And not, exactly. Wow. And the, the times that you think you did like crap are the times you booked the job. The times that you think you did amazing, you don't even hear a peep from them. And what was so frustrating was, you know, when you go in to see the casting director, they always post the, the, the headshot of the actors that are cast on the wall behind them. And uh, so every time, and I had six auditions. So every time I kept going back in there, more series regulars were- And you're waiting. Photos were on the wall. And, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God. Did you, like that guy only had one audition. That person had half an audition. I'm going through six of them. Uh, they got to the point where audition number five was me and a kid from New York City. And after I was done, I uh, came out of the audition and I said, Libby, the casting assistant, I said, what's going on? She said, um, the kid from New York City, he's being flown back to New York City right now. I'm like, oh, so I got the role? She's like, not exactly. I said, what does that mean? She goes like, well, they want to take, <laughs> they want to take two weeks off and they want to audition 30 something year old Asian guys. Oh, so you, no. you're going to be the 20 something year old candidate and they're going to whittle down to one 30 something year old guy. And then you two are going to go head to head against each other. And my talent agent told me, screw them. Tell them 
go to hell, you know? And I go, no, no, no. I mean, I've got, I've made it this far, right? I mean, literally I've been yelled at, I've been all kinds of things just, uh, and it's just, it's been abuse. And I've, I've, I've withstood it for this long. I'm gonna stand for it for a little bit longer. So they, can't, they found one other guy and brought, me, brought him in. And during the sixth audition, he and I went head to head. And uh, you actually see, you, you, but you don't see him auditioning, but you one in after the next, correct? I mean, you're not in the room together, no. right? Oh, no, God. I'm not in the same room. <gasps> I was like, that no. is brutal. That's the, no. taking it to a whole new level. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, the only guy that I saw, I, I saw him leaving the building as I was entering one of my auditions was the actor that played Short Round in Indiana T uh, Jones, The Temple of Doom. He was also in Goonies as Data, the young oh. Asian kid in Goonies. So oh. he, he was, he's an adult now, obviously. So he was walking out of the building and I was like, oh, yeah, it's the kid from Indiana Jones. So yeah, <laughs> that's the only person that I saw. And, yeah. Do you have your regulars like when you're going up for auditions? Because I always seem to be, especially in Australia, because it's such a small industry, it's the same five girls or oh, the yeah. same ten girls. But then when you move to when I moved to America, it was the same <laughs> same hundred girls. You know, yeah, they're, they're just the like same hundred like girls. Carbon copy of them. I'm like, oh geez, and, and they're probably you know they could probably do an American accent because they look like they're Amer American, not like me buffing about. Oh, yeah. <gasps> Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, yeah. Especially when you're when you're in a in a sub niche such as myself, you you get you, you end up knowing every single Asian actor that's living in LA, and it's like, oh, there's so and so, oh, there's so and so. So yeah, so and you I, end up knowing each other. I watched an interview where you said you that you thought that the writers actually thought that Kim was a Chinese name, but it's actually a Korean last name. And then they yeah. had you saying lines like, oh, the old Chinese proverb says, yeah. da -da 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 -da. Right. so all this time they. They thought that Kim was a Chinese name. Yeah, see, I, I <laughs> the entire seven years, every time I had to say a line like, you know, Tom, there's an old Chinese proverb or there's an old Chinese saying, da 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 da, -da may we live in interesting times or whatever. And, um, and I kept thinking, that's odd. Kim is clearly a Korean last name. Yes, of course. But yet they keep saying that. So then I justified <laughs> it as an actor. My backstory was, well, Harry Kim, when he was in Starfleet Academy, he took all his upper division electives in Chinese studies. You're He's just amazing. a huge, you know, fan of China studies. And I didn't learn about this until the final season when uh, the US spy plane was crashed, had crash landed in China. And um, China was refusing to acknowledge that the plane was in their possession. Um, the US repeatedly said, could we please have our plane back? And China was like, what plane? And they were stalling because they were trying to tear apart every piece of technology in that plane. Oh my gosh. To know, they were trying to reverse engineer all the technology. They wanted to know what was going on. And the word on the street was, there's going to be an international incident between China and the US. There may be war because of this. So I marched myself into the office because I had already known about the next Star Trek that was replacing Voyager called Enterprise. Right. And I knew, know in their, in their um, cast, there was an Asian character uh, played by, uh, the character's name was Hoshi Sato. So it's a Japanese name. So I felt that maybe they could change that to a Chinese name to sort of promote good relations between US and China, goodwill. So I walked into the office of, of one of the, the head writers and I said, listen, this is what I think you should do. You should really, really, you know, make Hoshi Sato like Hoshi Chan or something like that. And you said, uh, why would we do that? I said, because you need a Chinese character because of the US spy plane and everything in China. And they said, we already have a Chinese character in Star Trek. I said, what, w well, who? And the writer looks at me, he's like, you. I said, what? <laughs> you don't what? know? Oh, it was the, it was like somebody just slapped my face. All these really years? Hard. Twice, I was just my my chin was on the ground, and I said, "No, how could you not get no, that?" No, no, it's it's very. And I heard that they were quite they were very tough also with the writing. You weren't you weren't allowed to improvise that much and everything. Not at all. Not no. at all. Did you guys improvise at all? Did you get oh, mostly oh, everything? You're so lucky. Like there were times when we'd even get there, and they're like, "Oh, the script's not ready, so just you know have a muck around." We're like, "Huh." Like it was insane, or we'd have like you know a monologue or a scene prepared, have a look and Just then they'd improvise. right, and they were so like it was wild, especially towards the end. You know when you're shooting however many episodes at the same time, and you're doing ADR for two other separate, oh and God. there's a B unit and an A unit, and you're running back and forth, and scripts <sighs> were literally being delivered on the day or the morning of, and rewrites and stuff. Where you're like, Ugh. yeah. 
I would love to be in that sort of Wild West kind of way of just being able to improvise. What's well, so good because it's organic get, for you, you know, yes, so you can connect yes. with the character and everything. But And then straight after that, I went to work on another show as um, and it was completely, you know, Girl Next Door. I'd been doing Farscape for five years, then jumped onto Secret Life of Us, which was very, you know, so not soap opera, but, you know, very, very just... Uh, roommates all living together and very mm -hmm. you know gr great show but very very different and um, yeah. they were so pedantic if you didn't put the full <laughs> full stop in the right thing if you didn't like even you'd have directors going hit this mark then on that line turn that and I'm like huh and I was losing lines left right and center because it wasn't coming from an organic place it was really it was a totally different energy it was very trippy it's, it's you know what I find that there needs to be flexibility yeah. when it comes to a showrunner or a writer for television you got to be flexible yeah. and use the strengths of your actors for God's sakes, you know, find out, find out what they're good at and incorporate that into their character. And I, I think a lot of times with Star Trek and a lot of writers, they'll write a line and they won't say that line out loud. It'll be in their head. So when you as an actor start saying that line, it can be a tongue twister. And you're like, I can't even, I can't even get past this point. Can you please help me? Can I adjust this line a little bit? And most more times than not, uh, the message we got from the writing department was make it work, make it work, just do the lines. And we're like, oh. Yeah. And sometimes so you go, people not... don't speak like this. Yes, it makes sense. I get you're trying to describe what the heck is going on, but there's right. no way that people actually, this would come from a person's mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you texted me a photo of an image of, of a Voyager episode on in your television, and your kid is like walking in yeah, front of Yeah, she's like buffing around with a million toys and stuff. Because you usually, okay, so I try to confirm you, like, so I had a week to research yeah. properly because I am I get very <laughs> geeky and I like to watch as many episodes episodes as I can and then I Wikipedia then I YouTube interviews then I I'm a complete I love studying I love researching right. I love this is this is my passion and then you uh, and I was like hey Garrett um so uh, are we on are we not on are we and then like two days ago you're like oh yeah yeah by the way we're on I'm like oh, we're on so, so I'm like God. so I've watched like I'm like what are Garrett Garrett's favorite episodes what are Harry's big episodes because well, I, I, I turn, turned on the television I'm like 173 episodes I don't think I could physically get through that. So I'm like, I've just like, now Sky has had a crash course, as have I in Voyager, because there's so many eps. And then beautiful people who have been requesting you for weeks and oh. ha in the chat room have said, please, please, please bring on Garrett. So I said to the guys, guys, you're going to have to help me out here. So there's all these questions in the chat room that I've been ignoring because oh I've been okay. just, just completely and, and in awe just of you. just you know, if we don't get to all of them, Gigi, I am more than happy to come back for part two Ooh, or part three. Part three to what, of course. But the no extravaganza worries. to be continued. All right, well, listen, <laughs> they want to know what happened with the elbow, no elbow incident. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, Jerry Ryan and I. Jerry Ryan plays Seven of Nine, and, and um, this is one of the funnier stories. It's been told many times at conventions, but it's clear that not everybody in the world has gone to a convention, so it's good to be told here. Um, we were filming a what we call a walk and talk, and we have corridors similar in Farscape when you have corridors on the ship and you're doing a walk and talk down a corridor, right? So, and um, you know, a lot of times. The rehearsal was really for the camera crew um, to understand where they're supposed to, you know, where the, where the dolly is supposed to be, where the camera, where the lights. So it's not really a rehearsal for us. But so we rehearse. And typically when we go through a rehearsal, they don't get through the entire scene. They'll, they'll cut it early because they want to see something again. And so the director will say, cut, cut, back to one, back to one. So back to one in Hollywood lingo is back to your first position and start again. So I, being the gentleman that I am, thought that I would be gentlemanly and escort Jerry Ryan back to position one. So I was reaching back to grab what I thought was her elbow, her <laughs> arm, and just, you know, you know, be a gentleman. And then I realized oh. that I didn't grab her elbow. I, I grabbed one of her boobs, basically. Well, and they're right I, there. They're, it, I mean, it'd be tricky. I get, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so I look back at, at, at where my hand is, and she's just giving me this look like, mm -hmm. and I, I was like, oh, Oh my God, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she's like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. I said, I thought it was your elbow. And she's like, my elbow, huh? <laughs> and, and she's just giving me crap. The crew is laughing, everyone's laughing. I'm going, great. So then they they wrap, they wrap send us back to our trailers while they mm -hmm. light the scene. About an hour later, we're called back onto the set to film that particular shot in the corridor. And I, 
<laughs> I'm there first, but then when Jerry comes onto the set, you can hear her laughing. She's like laughing from the soundstage door all the way onto the set. Other people are laughing. I'm like, what is going on? She comes onto the set and she has a post-it note, a post-it note. One, there's two post-it notes. One is on her shoulder and it says elbow with an arrow pointing down to her elbow. Mm -hmm. She has another post-it note right above her boob, mm -hmm. her left breast. And it says not an elbow pointing <laughs> down to her boob. And so she calls, she's just, she struts on there and she's showing off, you know, these post-it notes and everyone's laughing and I see it. I read it. I'm like, Oh God, you know, you just, how long are you going to make me pay for this? Oh, no. just, well, I just want to give you a visual aid, a visual aid in case you needed, you know, a little bit more, a little bit of direction. Yeah. More direction. Yeah. <laughs> That's the elbow story. You know? uh, <laughs> so, and I've heard you uh, mimic people very well. Uh, I, I would I like, try. Uh, give me, give me a, Give me a Gigi. <laughs> uh oh, actually, maybe don't. No, you know what? Don't, because oh, who knows where this is gonna? You know me too, far too well. Okay, next, next character. Give me a Janeway. I'll give you a Dargo. Uh, give you a Janeway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's okay. The key with Janeway is you have to sound very regal. You have to found, you have to sound almost like a bit of royalty or a little bit of kind of a, a bit of Catherine Hepburn. So it, mm. it has to sound an educated voice, but then you add a little bit of helium. Like when you inhale a party balloon. <clears throat> <laughs> status support, <laughs> status, status support, Harry, Ensign, Ensign Kim. So it's a very, it's sort of in the neck like this, but it's almost like we're off to see the wizard. You know, it's a very, very distinct, voice that she um you know she she de she definitely sh kind of gives me a sideway glance whenever she hears me doing it doing she has setting. a very distinct voice though doesn't she she, she does she do she does and um you know that that voice was kind of a bit of a turnoff to some some fans didn't watch our show because her voice was a little oh, really? tough for them. yes in the beginning and to be perfectly honest that was a voice that was basically from a woman who was dealing with a recent divorce, raising two boys and using cigarettes as a way to sort oh. of ease her tension. So when you're, you know, when you're in your forties and you've been doing this a lot, your voice starts sounding like this and all that scratchy, like, you know, it, it gets like that. And there's a season, I don't know, season five where she stopped, she quit smoking and Kate's voice sounds like an angel oh, it's really? angelic sounding it's beautiful and then something stressful happened in her life and she picked up the cigarettes again oh, you know and it's just amazing? like oh it's gone again it's back to you know the Ooh. voice that we've heard season one so and um, i've seen a bit of a uh a, a, a good shatner impersonation uh when you were seeing some kung fu <laughs> fighting i believe <laughs> yeah we were at um your best buddy shatner we're we're yeah, my best buddy Shatner. We were at a uh, we were at a convention and and um, he was signing autographs like off to the side, and so I decided to sort of not punk him, but I was just gonna mess with him. So and when I came on stage, I came on as George Takei. So I said, um, <clears throat> "Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Takei, and I said uh, I'd like to introduce my good friend Bill Shatner, doing his rendition of." Everybody's kung fu fighting. So, <laughs> that song, right? So then I, I turned around and came back into, you know, with the microphone and I said, everybody's kung fu fighting. You know, so I started doing his little cadence and everything like that. And I thought that he would hear that, but where he was sitting, all the speakers were pointed away from him. So he didn't hear a peep of what I said, which was like, oh, I wanted to really just punk him just once. Um, yeah, but Shatner and I are okay. I mean, I, we, I talk a lot about when I first met him, how he kind of just, you know, he, he did the he did the weirdest thing. I mean, we he sh we shook hands, and he looked away and he yawned, and he pulled his hand away, and he wiped it off on his shirt like that. And my my hands were not sweaty. My hands weren't. I didn't. I wasn't holding a glass that had condensation on it, and so there was no no liquid on my hand. 
but he acted like I had cooties and it was really oh. like, <gasps> yeah. So this became, we ended up having this huge online battle that, that kind of got smoothed over, smoothed over by my significant other basically. But <laughs> when did um, all this you know, we're cool down? now. Yeah. We don't have any hatred anymore. Now, anymore. So. Never more, yeah. <laughs> never more. How long, never more. How long ago was all this? God, that this was back in, um, believe it or not, this happened back in, in at Tulsa, oh. where I met you initially. A million years ago. Yeah, a long, long time ago. Oh, gosh. A long, long time ago, where you thought that I was somebody else. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Uh, so out yeah. of all the comic cons that you've been to, what's it, do you have one memorable fan moment that has stood out amongst other? I mean, there must be a gazillion by this stage. Yeah, the ones that really stand out I, for me is just when people come up to me and say, um, they'll say something like, um, oh, I was, in a, I was in a horrific car accident and I literally my prognosis was that I wasn't going to live past the end of the week, you know, like the people that have been dealing with that, or maybe people that have been dealing with um, uh, very intense suicidal thoughts, you know, and they'll come up at a table and they'll say, listen, um, I just came up here to say thank you. I'm like, yeah, for what? My life. <laughs> and I was sitting here going, your life? And they'll, they'll go into saying, well, it was literally watching Star Trek Voyager that I, um, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and I realized that life was worth living and I just want to thank you. You're the reason why I'm still here. Yeah. And so when people say that, like, yeah, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? There's nothing, there's nothing you can do except for going, whoa, I impacted somebody to the point that they, they didn't kill themselves or that they, they survived a horrific car accident. I mean, that to me, that to me is the best thing, you know, that, 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 that could come from what I've what I've done. It's you know? huge, isn't it? Uh, because it's a it's a it's a you know obviously it's a job, but you you're very passionate about it and you yeah. love it. But it, and so it's phenomenal to think, you know, throughout the whole world, you've reached so many people on so many levels. Like that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, entertainment really, it's a way for people to escape. You know, yeah. it is um, all this content that you and I have put out there. You know, I've been part of. Um, it's vital for human beings to sort of balance themselves in a way. And Star Trek is unique in that, you know, every episode from the original series on uh, Gene Roddenberry, it was always his plan to, to film this sci-fi show, mm. but each show would have these underlying messages uh, uh, dealing with racism or, or, or gender inequality. Like a lot, he dealt with a lot of issues and had very positive messages that were buried within the episodes. And I remember I was signing autographs for the first time in New Zealand, in your sister country in New a way. Zealand. And uh, yeah, those Kiwis. Those and Kiwis. then um, I was sitting there and this guy comes up and he says, this is for my wife. Um, she's not, uh, she's not able to attend. She's at work right now, but could you sign this autograph for her? And I said, sure, what does she do? What does she do? It's like, oh, she works for the uh, New Zealand um, federal penitentiary. So I go, oh, she's a prison guard? And he's like, no, she's working uh, as a prison psychologist. So she, she counsels all the inmates. And so when she meets with the inmates, she finds out what issues that they've been going through in their life to sort of take them down the wrong path. And then she finds the corresponding Star Trek episode that deals with their issues oh. and makes them watch that as therapy. Oh my so goodness. I thought, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? That's I mean, this huge. is yeah. Like they're not gonna say like I'm gonna make you watch this episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, no, or Kardashians, no. right? So you're not gonna see that, or the the, the Housewives of Atlanta or Beverly Hills no, use this therapy. None not. of that, none of that reality <laughs> programming amounts to crap. To be there honest, is a lot you know? of fluff on television now. It, it's hard to find something good, especially now everything's sort of shut shop as well. It's like ah. Oh. Yeah. So uh, when you when you look back at the the journey that you had on the show, what what do you th what do you think your most challenging part of the role was? Hmm. Wow. Well, probably not allowing my character. The most challenging part was not like me, Garrett Wong. I've always been someone who enjoys making people laugh. I enjoy entertaining you, but specifically comedic from the comedic sense. Right. And that's just something that has never really 
really uh, been a part of my character on Voyager. I tried. I literally, I even said, hey, we can have a B storyline where we have a shipwide talent show and Ensign Kin gets up there and he does, uh, he does impersonations of the captain and this and that. And they would turn to me and the writers and said, mm, no, we'll pass on that. So I tried to, 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 to infuse some comedy into my character a little bit more, but they wouldn't allow it. So, yeah. And uh, so now when people try and find you online so they mm -hmm. can watch your podcast and yeah. your Garrett R. Wong on, That's right. on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, so that name, so the name, you would assume that my my handle would just be my name, Garrett Wong, G-A-R-R-E-T-T's, two T's, two R's, and then W-A-N-G. But I added the middle initial, Richard, for stands for Richard, because I was copying Jerry Ryan. Jerry Ryan was the first person to adopt <laughs> Twitter. And so her thing is at Jerry L. Ryan. So I thought, oh, that's cool. Seven of nine did that. I'll do the same thing. Little did I know that there was already somebody that was just using at Garrett w a m g oh, no. on twitter yeah. and i so i messaged this guy and because his photo his profile photo is you is taken, no it's taken from above of two kids getting up out of the ocean to the on the back of a boat okay on vacation yeah. and you see you don't see their faces you see the top of their heads and they're both clearly asian right oh. so um, so <laughs> anyone looking at that is like oh that's well, garrett that's when garrett. he was a kid with his cousin or his brother or whatever oh, no. so people will keep messaging this guy and I finally messaged him. I go, hey, what's up? And he's like, oh, it's you. And I go, yeah, it's the real Garrett or something. I said, well, which Garrett is this? And he says, I'm Singapore Garrett. And I go, oh, okay, that's cool. I said, do you mind changing your profile picture so you can actually you know, put up a photo that's actually of you so people are not confusing your account as me? And he was like, nah, mm -hmm. I'm not going to change it. I said, well, I mean, can I just ask you why he's like because i like what i i put oh, up no. i said can i ask you another question how old are you he's like 13 i go well that explains that makes it. Sense. now i know everything yeah he, he's just this teenager who's rebellious and didn't want to change it he's so. a very naughty boy not a boy he's a naughty boy yes. so not a boy. um i know you're a busy man so i don't want to keep you much longer but i do need to know if you could serve under any starfleet captain who would that be <laughs> Uh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> or is Kim finally I can't, captain? I can't sit there and say one over the Come other. Come on. A, I mean, I gotta say Janeway because that's the show I'm on, right? But I, 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 I love Picard equally. I think Cisco is amazing. Uh, even Kirk, you know, has his has his moments. Uh, I mean, it's it's interchangeable. I would say it's oh. interchangeable. Um, and and directing, writing producing would you ever create have you created stuff from scratch your own baby would you i i need to do more of that um i've been told by many people that you know my life i, I like i said i was born in california and moved to indiana well i did not say that on this one i've said it in other other podcasts california indiana bermuda memphis tennessee and back to california so i moved moved around quite a bit um i have a very interesting you know stories from my childhood and to really make that into a, a, a TV, you know, series would be something that yes. people would be interested in. Yeah, I mean, if someone can do Fresh Off the Boat, that uh, TV show with the all Asian family about their life growing up in Florida, why can't I talk about myself growing up in in Bermuda, where Having I spoke with a British Elvis's, accent, what, Memphis, Tennessee? Yeah, right? where I'm speaking with a like, Southern <laughs> accent. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting uh, material that can be mined. There's a lot of gems. There's a lot of diamonds in the rough there that that can be trans translated into uh, content. Were sure. you, did you not ha share the same uh, trainer as Elvis? Is it, did, I, did I get that I right? Did, yeah, my, my martial arts teacher was uh, uh, Master Kong Ree, and he is the one that, that uh, trained Elvis Presley. That's amazing. And, yep. then, and a lot of people would say that uh, there's a logo um, on the back of Elvis's private jet. You see the letters TCB with a lightning bolt in there. And a lot of people online have referenced this symbol to be a symbol of the Memphis Mafia, which is Elvis and his crew, you know. Um, and yes, they use that symbol, but it's not, it didn't originate with Elvis. It originated from our martial arts school because wow. that is our motto. The TCB stands for taking care of business is what it is. So That's cool. And, uh, so Elvis adopted that from, from my martial arts master, the, the same master. So it's pretty cool. 
Yeah. And then I heard you were training some kids, and they they took uh, they took their um uh, their skills home and beat their brothers and sisters up. <laughs> That was my first job. My first job was I was uh, I was 16. I was a martial arts instructor for a children's daycare, a sports care. So these kids, after they you know, went they went to the daycare, it wasn't just cookies and and what? coloring. Yeah. They literally did sports. <laughs> they did like tennis, basketball, and I taught them martial arts. Oh right. So then I was teaching these kids stuff, and then I got called into the to the boss's office, and she's like. Um, I really need to have a talk with you. And I said, why? Well, we've had more than one report of children going back home and basically practicing their new martial arts skills oh, out no. on their siblings. <laughs> and I said, you mean like full on kicking and hitting? Yes, oh, <laughs> like no, full on no, hitting no, their siblings. No. I said, okay, so I'm gonna have to tell these kids. And I, the next class I said, listen, this is not to be used on your brother, your sister, your cousin, your mother, your father, nobody that you're related to. This is what I'm teaching you in case bad people try to give you candy and kidnap you. Like this has nothing to do with your, your sister or your brother. Be so nice. please do not. So I had to make that little, you know, disclaimer. A little um, note, note. Yeah, oh. A little note. So uh, five years from now, what would, what's the dream? Where would you like to be five years from now? Wow. Oh my God. Five years from now. Uh, if I haven't, if I haven't, you know, written my own life story, basically, um, in a comedic, you know, from the comedic angle is what I would say. Um, if that hasn't happened, then five years from now to be a cast member on a sitcom would be probably the ultimate, you know, specifically something like a sketch comedy show. I mean, if I could be on Saturday Night Live or anything along those lines, I'd be, I, I'd be so happy. You know? That'd be amazing. That'd be fantastic. Well, let's, yeah. we'll do that. Will you hurry up? I will. I'll hurry up then. <laughs> we love you, Garrett. We love you. Thank you so uh, much for taking some time out. And, and I'm so serious. I'm so serious. You didn't have enough time to do complete research, so I am more than happy to come back on I'm gonna, in a couple months if you need me. Okay. Uh, so. Okay. You'll be getting the phone call tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be like, Garrett, it's me again. Hey, hey, G brother. We're all G's here. Yeah. Seriously. Love you, no, babe. You People don't know this. I've known I have known Gigi longer than most of the other actors in the sci-fi fantasy world. Yeah. I mean, literally, We've been it's been, I don't even know how many years now, but it's 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 got to be at least fifteen or more years. Easily, that I, that's why. Like I'm I'm. It's so funny because so in skies like from she wasn't even a month old and we had her on the road almost a Comic Con every single weekend ever since she mm -hmm. was born and then from March. Up, right up until now we, yeah. we've literally haven't pretty much left the house no. with her so it's such right. a and i miss human contact so much and i miss good conversations and just and of course like i always knew how blessed we were to have such an amazing job but you i just i look back like it feels like a dream now it feels like that yeah. long ago i'm like what a cool job oh my god and i did a couple of little comic cons which were great but it was so surreal going out and now everyone's masks and people don't talk to each other as much and you know it psychologically mucks with you a bit too you know and i was just like yeah. I, I took it i took it all so much for like i loved it and was very grateful but it felt like it felt it's so effortless when you look back at it now to go anywhere you've got to make sure there's no travel restrictions you've got your mask you've got your hand sanitizer you got da, 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 you know your hazmat suit on like the whole thing i just miss i miss i miss the comic con world i miss our beautiful family yeah. so I, i'm so appreciative that we can at least connect via zoom via via twitch it, it means the universe to all of us so thank you uh, definitely i was joking on another zoom call about how crazy times that we're living in and how I was wondering, are we going to be like that movie that John Travolta did, the TV movie, Boy in the Plastic Bubble, Ooh, <laughs> like many years no, ago, where we're say. all going to be in this, our own little, you know, our own little biospheres. And that's the only way we can go and talk to people. I won't do it. I'll be the random one running naked down the street going, <laughs> I love you, free hugs, free hugs. And everyone would be like, ah, oh, run away, run away. <laughs> in gray paint like Gianna. If right? you insist, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> 
Love you. Thank you Love so you too. much. Have a good day. Thank you. And everyone you have a great day. Everyone check out Garrett and make sure you check out his podcast. You Yes, rock. it's called the Delta Flyers. It's called the Delta Flyers. Um there is one called Delta Flyer Singular. That's two fans reviewing Voyager episodes. Uh, That's not us. Okay. So look for the Delta Flyers. Okay. Spotify, um, iTunes, anywhere you find your podcast. So Thank you so much, Gigi, for having me on. And I and I'm and I'm being serious. Good. You need me back for part two. I am here. Good. Well, you've got a lot of witnesses, so watch out. Yeah. Well, we got <laughs> a lot more to talk about. Thank bye. you, hon. Okay. We love you. Bye. Yeah, bye. bye. Awesome, Garrett. Yay! There you go, guys. Part two. Part two. Part. We're only just getting through part one. Part two. Jeez, Louise. Love you guys. Uh, that was very special. Thank you for, uh, thank you for inspiring me to connect with all my Comic Con friends. You guys rock. Uh, it's been very special. Our beautiful Twitch tribe. Ooh. Uh, so to give you a heads up, just wrapping up for the day. Uh, I'm just going to jump over here. We do our Zoom meets. We've got one tomorrow. Now for the subscribers, right now we're all going to go hang out in Discord. So Johnny, I saw popping up, has been gifting like a, like a champion. Thank you so much. You're an absolute sweetheart. Uh, if you are a new subscriber, come and hang out with us in Discord now. We hang out for about an hour and we have a voice chat with each other. It's lots and lots of fun. If you're new to the channel, press follow uh, so you can be alerted uh, that uh, we are online. I'm here every day every weekday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, Monday to Friday. We do Farscape rewatches. We do commentaries. We have great guests on our Thursdays. I also show some of my Aussie shows as well. And on Tuesday, we have my awesome brother, Jake Edgley, uh, tuning in from Australia. And we have a jam session because we both play music and sing music as well. And then on Monday, we have our Twitch highlight day. A Twitch tribe highlight day where the whole chat room chooses a Twitch member and they vote them in to come and be on the show on Monday and they zoom in especially and we get to meet them uh, and ask about their passion and and uh, how they got into sci-fi and all sorts of fun things so lots and lots of love guys tomorrow my amazing mother Jenny Edgley will be joining us on the show from Australia as well that will be at 5 p.m. And for our subscribers, come and hang out with me now in Discord. Lots and lots of love. I'm going to play a beautiful film that we did. It's called Hashtag. Uh, you can check out the full-length film on Dust. Uh, and yeah, lots and lots of love. Stay safe. We're all in this together. And it's always, always, always about the love. Love you guys. See you in Discord. Welcome to your new celebrity franchise. Open the door to the rest of your life. Four, three, two, one, ready, go. Oh, I'm gonna love all over you. X, what is your status? If you want to be successful, love what you're doing. Submit. 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 Product Flash. You know you are the best friends. You're bringing social media to the next level. Be famous. I wish I was you. The ultimate influencer. The ultimate celebrity. The ultimate you. You will have all the friends you've been dreaming of. Make their choices for them. You have opened the door to the rest of your life. Fame. Fame is just a heartbeat away.